A paper published by a respected U.S. think tank, the World Watch Institute, two World Bank environmental advertisers claim that instead of 18% of global emissions being caused by meat, the true figure is 51%. How does eating animal products contribute to 51% of global greenhouse gas emissions? Well, that report, it's controversial. It hasn't been backed up by a lot of other um, subsequent reports, but they're essentially saying that the basis for the original UN report was a bit off. It wasn't 18%, they're saying 51%. And they're factoring in some other components. Um, but I think the big thing we have to look at is what is the true cost of deforestation and all the land use that goes to livestock production. And when you factor in not only um, cattle bar belching and farts, not only you know, the, the, what it takes to grow the land, to grow the grain or the soy that they're fed and to transport the meat and all of that, but you also factor in what the land could have been doing if it was forest. It would be sequestering carbon instead of emitting it. And when you look at the full dynamic, then it's possible that 18% isn't high enough. Ultimately, um, we have a profoundly inefficient system when we feed biomass to livestock. It just doesn't make any sense. You know, Grass, it's true, can't be eaten by humans directly. Livestock can eat it and then turn it into something we can't eat. So there are certain places in the world where the only thing they can grow is grass. And for a farmer in Tibet, you know, for a family in, in certain places in Kenya, you know, where the, where the land is too arid to grow crops of any kind and it can only grow grass, then sure, having a cow out there that grazes over the course of, you know, 10 acres you know, or a yak or, or a goat um, could help that family to subsist and survive in a difficult circumstance. But for those of us who live in cities, for those of us who live in homes and have a part of the modern industrialized world and are buying our food from stores, for the most part, those are coming from very large operations. And for the most part, those very large operations are directly involved in the destruction of the natural world so that we can create more food for our voracious appetites for meat and animal products. And the destru destruction of the natural world has so many impacts from a climate perspective. And so at the end of the day, if you care about the future of our climate, if you care about the future of w that our children will inherit, then I think you now is the time to light a fire in you that says, I want to participate in a healthy, ethical, and sustainable future for humanity. And now is the time to step forward and say, let's not participate in modern industrialized meat production because it is a central driver of everything we're trying to change. In 1860, the average age of the onset of puberty in girls was 16.6 years. In 1920, it was 14.6. In 1950, 13.1. 1980, 12 and a half. And in 2010, it had dropped to 10 and a half. Similar sets of figures have been reported for boys, albeit with a delay of around a year. How does eating animal products contribute to the earlier age of the onset of puberty? My heart just kind of breaks with the human impact of the early onset of puberty because kids are being flooded with hormones that they are not ready for. And uh, so many girls at the age of 10, 11, 12, they're just starting to figure out who they are. And so many now are facing serious issues with self-esteem, feeling like they don't belong. Many of the girls I know are suicidal because they're filled with a lot of self-hate. And I believe that the early onset of puberty is pushing them for something that they're not biologically ready for. They're not emotionally ready for. They're not psychologically ready for. I guess they are biologically ready for it. And um, this has impacts on teen pregnancy rates. This has impacts on child teen suicide rates. And I believe it's being fueled in part by what we're eating, by the presence of hormone disrupting chemicals. And perhaps most of all, by the amount of dairy we're consuming. 
because modern dairy cows are pumped full of hormones every day of their lives to keep them producing milk in large quantities. So what do you think is the impact on a human being of consuming those hormones into our bodies? Well, guess what? We're mammals too. So this can fuel uh, all kinds of hormone problems. And this is statistically proven. There are studies showing this. Now, we don't have a lot of studies looking at puberty specifically and showing that, for example, vegans or people who don't eat dairy in their childhood have later onset of first menses because there aren't that many kids growing up without milk yet. But it's starting, and I predict we will have that data soon. And it stands to reason that when you look at this correlation, we've been eating a lot more dairy over the last 150 years. It's a steady progression. And we've been treating our cows with more and more hormones during that time. And so perhaps there's a connection here. Now, correlation is not causation. We don't know with certainty what's causing it. But I would say that there's a pretty strong reason to think that it could be the dairy products that we're consuming and the way we're producing them that's driving this. More than 90% of crop varieties have disappeared from farmers' fields. Why has this happened? We live in a time of unprecedented um, loss of biodiversity. That's showing up in the natural world, and it's also showing up in the farmed world. As certain high yield crops become the norm as monocropping becomes the norm and we lose something profound in that process because crop rotation biological diversity are fundamental to healthy soil and they're fundamental to a healthy ecosystem if you were a cabbage moth and you were looking for some cabbages do you think you'd be interested if you could smell even 30 miles away a massive field of you know, thousands of acres of cabbage? Of course you would, and you'd smell it from a really long distance. But with biodiversity, you mix things up, and it changes the whole equation. So we're losing more crops to pests now than we were 100 years ago, even 50 years ago, percentage-wise. Even with all of the pesticides we're spraying, because we are creating such inferior, less healthy crops, and because we're doing this monocropping system. So this loss of biodiversity is bringing down nutritional value because every single type of potato has a slightly different mix. Every single type of apple has a slightly different mix. When you only get one thing or a couple things, you lose out on so much of that. But also because every potato draws different things out of the soil. Every apple draws different things out of the soil. And golden delicious are going to draw certain things, right? So when you, when you have a whole ecosystem that's getting depleted of the same nutrients that that one crop needs, then other nutrients may be there, but they're not getting tapped. So then essentially this, the nutrient value of our crop is going down, down, down because the soil is getting depleted of it. So biological diversity is critically important. This is one of the good reasons to support local farms, family farms, sustainable farms, to grow a nice garden, to compost, to support composting, whether it's on the municipal level or in your own backyard because all these ways can help to regenerate the soil and add to the biological diversity of our ecosystems.